I'll go ahead and introduce myself as uh, Dr. Banton uh, gets a uh, presentation up. Uh, my name is Brandon Hawkins. I'm in the Bowie and Cass County area at Country Natural Resource. So it's good to have everybody on today. And then if you don't know me, I am Savannah Harrington, and I am the Ag and Natural Resource Agent in Guadalupe and Gonzales, Texas, or Gonzales County in Seguin, Texas. And then to, uh, today we're going to do, um, Dr. Jason Banta will be presenting on market updates. And I also just want to introduce Ms. Ashley Pellerin James as our interim program leader. And then Dr. Banta, you can start whenever you are ready. All right. Well, thank you for having me today. And as uh, they mentioned, if you have a question, feel free to put that in the chat box. As far as unmuting, we'll probably hold those questions to the end. Uh, if you'll just go ahead and stay muted just so we don't get background noise while we're going. Uh, but do feel, feel free to put those in the chat box as we're going. I wanted to kind of start off. Uh, some of you have seen these graphs. Uh, if you haven't and you're interested in them and, and would like them on a weekly basis, if you get in touch with your county agent, they can get in touch with me and, and we can get you on a list for that. Uh, but what I do is uh, record the highest prices reported for bull and steer calves from six livestock markets, uh, three of them in East Texas and three of them in Central Texas, just to kind of give us a trend of where the market's going. And so on the far left here, you can see January of 2022 going through this past week. And so while there's some ups and downs in the market, and, and that's normal, and we'll talk about that a little later, we have, uh, especially the past uh, six months or so, really been on an upslope in cattle prices. I think that'll continue a little bit, but, but we're going to probably start to plateau and we won't see as much of a steep increase. Uh, but cattle prices, are, especially calf prices, have moved in a very positive direction uh, recently. When we look at prices for packer cows, uh, the same time period here, the green line would be the highest prices reported and the blue line would be the lowest prices reported. And we'll talk about that range later on. Again, you can see year over year. So if we look at um, May of this year versus May of last year, we're higher year over year. Uh, so again, that's a positive thing for cow-calf producers. Uh, for those of you who are interested in kind of a, a longer range outlook, there's a lot of different organizations out there, but one of them I really like because um, they publish a document with cattle price outlooks as well as uh, crop outlooks and oilseed outlooks and biofuels and some other things is the Fapri Group out of Missouri. If you're interested in finding their information, if you'll just Google F-A-P-R-I, Fapri, and then the word Missouri, it will pull you um, to their website. And, and like I downloaded uh, their 2023 20, Outlook, uh, which is like a 77 page document. Uh, I'm gonna show you just a couple screenshots from that document. And so the top left is just showing beef cow inventory uh, here in green and then slaughter cattle inventory in blue uh, going back to 2024. And they actually predict all the way out to 2032. So kind of the light gray is where we've already had. The darker gray is predictions moving forward. Uh, so one thing you kind of want to pay attention to is this green line. You look at beef cattle inventory, if you remember back, we saw pretty good prices back 14 and 15. We didn't have a lot of beef cows at that point in time. We rebuilt the beef cow herd. And when we did that kind of dropped those prices, but you can see due to drought and some other reasons, the beef cow numbers have really declined and they're actually uh, lower than they have been since they started keeping track of those records. So the last 50 plus years. So that's a, a positive thing moving forward. And, and you see they're predicted to increase a little bit more. Uh, a lot of that's going to be dependent on drought as well as the overall economy and then start increasing back up. And then the blue line would be the number of slaughter cattle. 
if we look at what that's going to have impact on prices, and so here on the, the bottom right-hand graph, the blue line is what we refer to as a feeder steer, and that would be a steer weighing 800 pounds uh, that would be ready to go into the feedlot. So you see the very tail end of what's on the graph is kind of those high prices we saw back in 14 and 15. Then we saw that big decline as those cow numbers went up. And then you see that start increasing again and in, in kind of their projections anyway, as far as where we're uh, maybe going moving forward. Their projections showing the peak for feeder steers at least being kind of similar to the peak we saw uh, previously. If we look at fed steer, and so this would be like a 13 to 1500 pound steer coming out of the feedlot. You can see how those prices dropped as we started getting more supply. Um, but then as cow numbers have gone down, those prices have, have gone up. And we've actually exceeded for the fed cattle coming out of the feedlots on the prices we saw back in 14, 15. So that market's a little bit higher and you can kind of see what their projection is moving forward. So again, you can get that uh, from the FAPR group, F-A-P-R-I. So now that we've kind of looked at where the market's at and where the market may be going, let's look at some of the things that really impact the income in our operation. And so the question I'll normally ask the group is what has the biggest impact on income? And there'll be a lot of answers. Typically, you know, people talk about expenses. They'll talk about sale price of the calves and they talk about weight of the calves. But really the biggest thing for cow-calf producers that impacts how much income we generate is actually pregnancy rates. We got to get those cows pregnant. We got to get them to have a calf and we have to have that calf weaned. That's going to have a bigger impact than almost anything else when we look at uh, income for our operation as, as well as profit potential. And remember, body condition score is highly dependent on, or excuse me, pregnancy rates are highly dependent on body condition score. Remember, body condition score, we score those cattle from a one to a nine with a one being really, really thin and a nine being really fat. And you can see as we increase body condition score, we increase pregnancy rates on those cows. And so what that tells us is for cows four years of age and older to optimize our pregnancy rates, we need those cows in at least a body condition score of five or better around calving. And for two and three year old females, we want them in a six or better body condition score around calving. Uh, just a reminder what a body condition score five looks like, because this will be important later on uh, when we talk about marketing packer cows and packer bulls. Body condition score five, we can't see any ribs from hooks to pins. They regain that muscle, so we don't have any muscle loss, but we really haven't started putting on any extra fat in regards to fat pounds or much extra fat down in the brisket. So that'd be a body condition score five cow. Here's another picture of a body condition score five cow. This one's a little harder to look at because uh, the color of the hair as well as a little more hair there. So uh, make sure you, you pay attention to that and, and really look close. So when we think about how we generate income from the operation, it's going to be a function of how many calves do we wean? What's the weight of those calves when we sell them? And then what do those calves bring per pound or per 100 pounds of body weight? And so we really need to think about all three of those. But the one that's most important is going to be the percent of the cows that we expose to the bull. What percent of those cows actually wean a calf? So what else is going to impact profitability? Obviously, expenses in our operation can have an impact on profitability. And so we have to be aware of that. Well, one thing we have to be mindful of is sometimes I see in popular press out there or, or have a producer say, well, I want to be a, a low cost producer. Well, is being a low cost producer really what we want to be or would we rather be a high return on investment producer? And personally, I would rather be a high return on investment producer because being low cost, we may avoid spending some money where if we spend a little bit of money, we could get a really good return on that money. So we don't want to just look at the expense. We want to look at what benefit are we going to get on that expense? 
Now, if we don't get any benefit, yeah, that's probably an expense we want to cut. But if we can spend some money and get even more money back in return, then that's something we want to do. So it's not just about being low cost. It's about investing those dollars wisely in our operation. So when we think about income from cattle sales, what generates income from the operation? And obviously, everybody thinks about calves that we're selling at weaning. But one thing that we forget about sometimes is those packer cows and packer bulls can represent a pretty large portion of our annual income. And so we need to think about them and we need to manage and market them appropriately to capture that income. Uh, I realize there's a lot on this graph or excuse me, on this slide, but I don't want you to get hung up on the details. What I want you to really focus on is the bottom down here. So what I did was kind of think about uh, if we had a hundred cow operation, let's just say we had three bulls. And as a goal, we were shooting for an 85% wean calf crop. And we culled 12% of the cows uh, per year and one bull each year. Um, and then if we we're selling those calves at 550 pounds, uh, I figured a price for the steers, I figured a price for the heifers, and just assume we're going to sell everything. And so I went ahead and calculated an average price. And so that ended up being in, I based this off of fall prices because that's what most operations produce is, is fall barn calves, or excuse me, spring barn calves that we sell in the fall. Uh, but a 550 pound calf average price for the steers and heifers of 152, that'd be about $838 a head a little over $71,000 in income. Now that's not profit, that's income. If we look at income from our packer cows and our packer bulls, 1,150 pound cows, $90 per hundred weight, uh, $1,035 per head, or a little over $12,000 in income, and then selling one bull a year, about $2,200. So when we look at that, that total income would be almost 86,000. 83% of that's represented by our calf sales, but 17% in this example would be represented by the income from our packer cows and packer bulls. So if we think about 17% of our annual income, is that worth managing and making sure we can get the most out of those animals? Absolutely. And I'll tell you, that's that's pretty consistent. It'll vary a little bit, but roughly you can figure about 15 to 20 percent of the annual income is often coming from the packer cows and packer bulls. So those animals that we're not using for breeding purposes anymore and that we're selling. So when we think about selling animals, whether it be calves or whether it be cows, do we want to focus on price per pound or do we want to focus on total dollars generated per head? And while it's tempting to focus on price per pound, what we really want to focus on is total dollars per head. That's what's going to be most important to our operation. So now I want to take a little bit of time of talking about some marketing options and avenues for those packer cows and packer bulls. And then we'll talk about some of the things that impact the value and the price of those packer cows and packer bulls. So a lot of packer cows and packer bulls will be sold through the regular weekly auction. And, and that's a, a really good option for those animals. Some people will look at selling them direct to some packers. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages of that, depending on the packer you're going to and what kind of programs they have. Um, it may surprise a lot of people, but there's often a lot of uh, packer cows and packer bulls that are sold in Texas, but they get shipped to several different states across the U.S. and actually slaughtered there. And so those better animals, having them in a place where multiple buyers can bid on them sometimes can generate you more income there. Um, if you have a truckload lot of them, so we're thinking 48 to 50,000 pounds, some of the bigger packers, you can go direct to them. So an example would be Cavanus. Uh, Cavanus also uh, sometimes has special programs that if you can provide cattle at certain times of the year, typically around Christmas 
or if you can certify that those animals won't have any kind of foreign objects, uh, i.e. birdshot or buckshot, darts, broken needles, there can be some premiums for those animals. So if you're a larger producer, that may be something you can take advantage of. And then maybe we're in a situation, a uh, large part of the U.S. Uh, has been in drought. Uh, fortunately, large parts of Texas, especially the eastern half, aren't in drought anymore. But we talk about the central half and especially the panhandle. There's still ongoing droughts in those areas and, and there's still producers that are having to sell not what we would consider a coal animal, but animal that still has uh, a lot of breeding value left. And so that's generating income for the operation. And so you may sell those animals through a special replacement female cell like Jordan Cattle Company out at San Saba has. They have one of those uh, basically every month. They had one this past uh, Saturday on May 6th. Uh, there's a website called The Cattle Range uh, where you can pay to have a classified ad listing and actually sell some of those animals there and maybe capture a little bit more money for them. Are there some other private treaty avenues as well? But think about how you can maximize the income on those uh, animals, those breeding animals that you're needing to sell that aren't uh, at the end of their productive lifespan. So what are some of those factors that affect the selling price of those uh, packer cows and packer bulls? Well, time of the year is going to be a big one. And I realize the dates on this are a little older, but we always see this pattern and, and this uh, graph shows it really well, is we will see the highest prices for those packer cows and bulls in the early spring, typically uh, late winter, early spring, February, March, April there. Um, then we start to see a decline. We see the lowest prices typically in the fall, and then those prices start to pick back up. And you may be wondering, well, why do we see that trend? Well, if we think about it, the majority of the calves in the U.S. are going to be born in the springtime. So that means we're going to wean those calves in the fall. And so a lot of people will call those cows in the fall so they don't have to feed them through the winter. So we see more supply in the fall. And so that pushes those prices down a little bit compared to the spring where we don't see as many of them, which helps prop those prices up some. I mentioned this range earlier. So if we look at the green line um, would be the highest prices reported. The blue line would be the lowest prices reported. We often have a 20 to $40 range between the high and the low there. And so why do some packer cows and bulls bring more money than others? Now, the other thing I'll tell you, it's not shown in the graph, but there will be some that actually bring below this blue line. So some weak animals, some injured animals, high risk animals in terms of cancer eye and those kind of things, they're even going to be below this line. So this would represent uh, just thinner animals uh, or lower yielding animals, not those high risk animals. So here's an example. So if we look at that cow there in the front part of this picture, uh, she's considerably smaller than the other cows in the pen. And so she's going to bring less money. And part of that reason is if you think about the packer, it's going to cost them the same amount of money to process her as it will a cow that weighs four or 500 pounds more. And so they figure that in. And so those smaller, lighter weight cows are gonna be discounted some in relation to a larger, heavier cow. That's also part of the reason why bulls will bring more than what cows will. Uh, body condition score is a, a big thing and to kind of hit the, the best part of the market. You want those market cows and market bulls and market cow or packer cow. We're, we're talking about the same animal. There's just two different terms that industry uses. Uh, we want them in a body condition score of four to six. Uh, that's where we get the best yield out of those animals, uh, where we're getting the most meat um, and we're not getting too much fat in that situation. And that makes a big difference. And, and one of the reasons a lot of 
uh, cows sell lower than those better prices we were talking about is because as producers, we end up holding on to them too long and they get too thin before we sell them. So we'd be much better off if we'd sell them a little sooner. So remember, a four to six is really what we're looking for. We look at this cow body condition score of one. She's just really, really thin. If we look at her, how much meat are we really going to get off that cow? And we're going to get a whole lot less meat off that cow compared to one in a body condition score of four or five or six. And again, it's going to cost the same to process her. So she's not going to bring near as much per pound. Uh, we look at a body condition score of three cows. She's going to bring more than those body condition score of one cows. But again, she's just not going to yield as much meat as what those higher body condition score cows will. So she's not going to bring quite as much either. We look at this really, really fat cow. Well, she's going to yield a good amount of meat, but she's also going to yield a lot of fat that the industry is not necessarily looking for. And so she's not going to yield really any more meat than a cow in a body condition score of five or six, but she's going to yield a whole lot more fat. And so the buyer is going to discount that price because they don't want to pay the same for all that fat as they would for muscle, if that makes sense. Um, if there's some kind of a illness or injury or health uh, concern, so cancer eye would be one of them. And so if we look at this cow, she's got a little bit of cancer eye in her eye here. This is when we need to market this cow or this is when we need to treat this cow. We don't need to look at this cow and say, well, she just had a calf. Let me wait six months and wean the calf and then sell her. There's a good chance that that eye can get much worse in a quick period of time. And she goes from a cow that has pretty good value to a cow that may have hardly no value at all. Uh, since we're at lunchtime, I went ahead and, and took the picture of the really bad cancer eye cow out. Uh, but most of you have seen those or can imagine. If you have some questions, uh, I, I can share that later on. But I figured since we're at lunchtime, probably better to take that picture out. Other thing that will impact the value and reduce the value of those animals, if they have really big horns, uh, that can reduce value. And that has to do with how many they can transport on a trailer and transportation costs. And then if we have injuries or lameness, uh, that's going to reduce the value quite a bit. Uh, the other thing we need to remember here is if we have an on-farm injury and it's questionable, if that animal can, can really stand on a trailer and, and walk on and off that trailer, probably want to visit with their veterinarian and, and we may need to look at humanely euthanizing that animal on the farm or ranch. So what are some marketing channels for our stalker and our feeder uh, calves? So again, our, our local weekly auction is where we market a lot of those calves. Uh, and that's the nice thing about that is Almost every week of the year, you can take some cattle in and sell them when you want uh, and pretty convenient uh, to get them there that morning or the evening before, or sometimes you may want to even take them in earlier if that's better for you logistically. Uh, preconditioned calf sales. And what do we mean by a preconditioned calf sale? That's a calf that's going to be weaned. The male calves are going to be castrated those calves are going to have a vaccination protocol they all go through. And then at most of our preconditioned calf sales, and so this is a picture from the net bio sale at Sulphur Springs, is those calves are going to be co-mingled into groups of similar type and kind. So you may take 20 calves into the net bio sale, and those calves may end up being sold in 10, maybe even 15 different groups, depending on how much variation there is in weight, type, and kind. And the way that works is uh, prior to the sale, they will bring every animal in individually and weigh it and assign it to whatever group that it matches in. And so when they sell that group, the price for the group, they apply that to the individual weight of your animal. So you get paid for the weight of your animal. 
um, preconditioned calf sales because those animals have less risk than a calf being marketed through the weekly auction because they're weaned and they're vaccinated is there's typically a premium associated uh, with those calves. And, and that will average about five to eight dollars a hundred weight, uh, depending on time of year and weight of those animals. If you're dealing with larger groups of animals so that you can sell in a truckload lot, you can sell in 48 or 50,000 pound lots, uh, then a video auction. The most common one for us is going to be superior livestock video, um, where those cattle never leave your ranch until after they're sold. So a representative will come out and take a video of those animals. And then on sale day, they show the video along with the description. And then people all over the U.S. would bid on those calves. Um, one nice thing about selling calves on a video is if you don't like where the market is that day, you can PO those calves for a small fee and they've never left your property. The other thing you can do with a video auction is say the calves are born in the spring. So they're born March, April. You can actually sell those calves ahead of time during the summer. And so they'll talk about big summer sales. And so throughout the summer, Superior at different locations will have three, four, five day sales where they may sell a few hundred thousand calves. And you sell that calf in June, but the buyer is not actually going to pick that calf up maybe till October. And so you can sell them ahead of time if you want to do that from a marketing strategy. A lot of people will do that. And then you have a specifications you have to meet for that contract in regards to weight and those kind of things. Another reason some people like doing the video auctions is they get what's called a part pay, or you can almost think about it as a down payment. And so when that buyer buys your calves, you're going to go ahead and get a $40 per head part pay that you can go ahead and use that money to pay some expenses between when you sell those calves on the video and when the buyer actually picks them up in the fall or whenever they pick them up. Uh, from a price standpoint, if we kind of think about price per pound, typically our video auctions tend to be the highest, followed by our preconditioned calf sales, followed by our local auction markets. But we will see some variation across that. And that's assuming similar quality calves. We can take some uh, very good calves at a local market and they would bring more money than some calves that aren't as good a quality that we sold on a video. So it, you, you got to compare equal quality there. Another option is to have, and we see this done with some smaller groups, less than the 48 or 50,000 pound groups, is having a, somebody come out and buy those calves uh, from you directly. Now, if you're going to do this, you need to make sure you're very familiar with the calf market and know what kind of price that person's offering you. One of the nice things with an auction strategy is you have multiple people bidding on those calves. So there's pros and cons to all those different strategies, but those would be some of the main strategies for marketing those, marketing those stalker or feeder calves. Another option is you may decide you want to retain ownership of those calves all the way through the feed yard. So you grow them out after weaning, you send them to the feed lot, they feed them for 100, 150 days, maybe longer in certain situations, and then you sell them when they're coming out of the feed lot. Uh, typically, if you're going to send cattle to the panhandle of Texas, they're going to want uh, at least 100 head. Uh, to feed. Some, some of them may feed pens of 50 head, but most are going to want a 100 head pen of cattle. If you want to retain ownership and feed smaller groups, some of our South Texas feed yards uh, will feed smaller groups. So that may be an option if you want to look at that. So what are going to be some factors affecting the selling price of our calves? So time of year, just like we looked at time of year on the cows, that's going to be important on calves as well. Um, and so when we think about time of year on calves, uh, the spring, so for that five-weight calf, the spring is going to be kind of the high of the year in the fall. 
would be the low of the year. So if you look at, this is some data going from 1992 to 2013, we still see those same trends today. Sometimes we'll see a little variation, but we'll see the same general trend. As you see, the spring's the high, the fall tends to be the low. And really, so the green line is just one year. The line you really want to pay attention to here is the red line. And so October and November tend to be the lowest prices for those calves. And you say, well, why is that? It goes back to the fact that most of the calves in the U.S. were born in the spring, so they're sold in the fall, so it's a supply and demand deal. We have less calves that are born in the fall and sold in the spring, and so that does generate typically higher prices per pound for those calves that are sold in the spring. Now, you may be saying, well, I'm going to switch and only have fall-born calves. Make sure if you're going to go that direction, you have a really good winter pasture program. If you don't have a winter pasture program, you can end up spending too much money on feed to carry those lactating calves, cows through the winter. And that advantage you got in selling those calves, you'll actually spend more money in feed than what that's worth. So fall calving can work well if you have winter pasture and it helps take advantage of those higher uh, seasonal highs. Color can have an impact. And the big thing here is we want solid color calves. They, they tend to sell much better. So if we look at a solid black calf, uh, Charlet colored calf, so they're kind of uh, smoky color or cream. Um, if you're selling in big groups, it's not quite as critical. If you're selling, you know, calves that are being sold one at a time through the local weekly auction, then those two colors probably sell a little bit better than some other colors. And that's because the buyers need enough of those calves so they can put a similar group together. So we may have some calves of a different color that are really, really good. But if there's not enough of them for those buyers to put a truckload together of a similar type and kind, they may not bring as much. Uh, when we look at some of our red cattle or some of our brinder cattle, because they're being co-mingled with other producers' cattle of similar color, type, and kind, they may do a little bit better in a preconditioned calf sale than what they would at a weekly auction. So it's just about that buyer being able to put together a uniform group. Now, typically, if we think about color, our spots or our striped cattle tend to get discounted compared to our solid colored cattle. The exception to that is if we look at the tiger stripe females, so that's a Hereford Brahmin cross female, those females can bring a premium. Now, the steer mates typically get a discount, but the females can be bring a premium. So there can color can, as far as how it impacts price, can vary a little bit. Bit, depending on if we're talking about cattle that are going to go to the feedlot versus replacement heifers in some situations. Perceived breed type is a big one because that buyer, especially when those calves are going through a local market, they don't know the exact breed makeup. So they're going to base it off of the perceived breed type. So kind of a quick review of our breeds here is if we think about our British breeds, Ang our Red Angus, Hereford, Angus, and Shorthorn is what we'll refer to as our British breeds. Our continental breeds, so Charlet, Simmental, Limousine, Gelvy, Bronby, Main Anju would be some examples there. And then if we think about our Brahmin or Boss Indicus uh, influence breeds, so our Straight Brahmin or Beef Master or Santa Gertrudis or Simbral or Brangus and our Brayford there. And so what we kind of want to do is there's, there's not a certain breed type that's always going to be at the top of the market, but there are some combinations we want to make sure we avoid to prevent any kind of significant discounts. So we want at least a quarter percent British in those cattle, no more than a quarter continental unless you're selling through a, a special branded program, no more than a quarter Brahmin influence or dairy or longhorn. And if you can kind of stick to those percentages, you you're not, may not top the market, but you're going to avoid some of those significant discounts. 
weight of cattle has a big impact. So if we look at a 200 pound calf versus a 500 pound calf per pound, the 200 pound calf will bring more money than what the 500 pound calf will. But obviously per head, the 500 is going to bring more. Um, and what we what we call that change in price. So as we go from a lighter weight animal to a heavier weight animal, those prices generally decrease. We call that the price slide. Um, that how much price slide we have going for each hundred pounds increase in weight will vary a little bit depending on our grain market. And so when corn is high, the price drop we see is less compared to when the price of corn is cheap. So when corn is high, um, the price discount from a five weight steer to 700 pound steer is less because the feedlot wants you to put more weight on that 700 pound steer on grass when prices of corn are high. We need some muscling that's gonna impact those calves. So if we look at this calf, if you look back here through the stifle and the lower quarter of this calf and the hip, this is a well-muscled calf. And so if we look at calves that all other things being equal, except we have some that have a good amount of muscle and some that are extremely light muscled, the calves with more muscle will bring more per pound than the lighter muscle calves will. Now, we do have to be aware of is there's what we would refer to as some double muscled cattle out there. So almost think of like a, a bodybuilder, real extreme muscle shape. Those calves typically receive a discount. So there's a limit on how much muscle we want. So size of the calves. So here people talk about small, medium and large frame cattle. So this would kind of be an example of that if we look at this. Black steer, that's going to be a, a small frame, a medium frame, and a large frame. So when they finish out in a feedlot, this steer may finish out at 900 or 1,000 pounds. This steer may finish out at 15 to 1,600 pounds. And so typically, um, the medium and large frame cattle will be similar in price. The smaller frame cattle uh, will be a couple of dollars per hundred weight lower in price. And then if we have some real extremes in frame size, so if we look at these uh, stocker calves coming into a feedlot here, so they're coming into a feedlot at a lighter weight. But if we look at this red calf here compared to all these other calves along here, this is even smaller than what we would call a small frame. And so that calf would receive even a bigger discount there. Uh, again, showing kind of small frame versus medium and large frame calves there. Management practices can have an impact on how much those calves bring. And so if we look at selling bull calves versus steer calves, um, time of year and weighted calves will impact the premium or discount. But typically, if we think about a 500 pound calf, um, the steer calves will be worth five to eight dollars per hundred weight more than the bull calves. So if we think about five dollars per hundred weight times uh, five hundred weights, uh, that's an extra twenty five dollars a head for castration. So even if you don't want to castrate, you could pay somebody to castrate those calves and still come out ahead in that situation. Um, lighter weight calves, we see a smaller difference in steers versus bulls. Heavier weight calves, we'll see an even bigger difference. So the heavier weight bulls will be discounted more than the heavier weight steers. Time of year, hot weather, the bull calves are discounted more in relation to the steers compared to cooler times of the year. Now, to take advantage of the premium for the steer calves, you need to make sure there's other steer calves being sold at that location. So if you go to an auction market and they're selling a thousand calves and there's only 50 steers there, yours and another producer or two, because there's not enough for those buyers to put together a low lot of those steers, we don't see the full premium there. 
So we need to make sure we market those steers with plenty of other steers to, to really see that good premium. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't castrate them because it's still, from an animal standpoint, it's the right thing to do. The earlier we can castrate them in life, the better off for that animal. Uh, polled animals or dehorned animals uh, will bring a little bit more than what horned calves will be. So that's something to be mindful of. And really, when we look at genetics on the beef side today, for a lot of our breeds, we have really good polled options. And so we can do it that way. Some other factors is we need to talk about feel. And so feel is how full is that rumen of hay and feed? Do they do they look like they've just been out eating a bunch of feed and they really and drinking a bunch of water and they have a lot of feel in them? That's going to reduce the price a little bit. Uh, on the same token, if they've been held off of feed or water for quite a while and they're shrunk in, that'll increase the price a little bit. Now that doesn't mean we want to shrink them because you'll end up the amount of pounds you shrink, that adjustment in price typically won't make up for that. So we definitely don't want to intentionally shrink those cattle quite a bit, but we don't want to overly fill them either. The other thing we have to be mindful of is condition. All right. And so condition is another way to talk about fat. So if we look at those uh, stocker steers and heifers that we're selling, if they're a little too fat, too fleshy, they're typically going to be discounted. And so one of the places we have to be mindful of that is for producers who want to use a creep feeder, because with that creep feeder, you often get those calves a little too fat and that will actually discount their price. The other thing is if we look at the cost of feed and how much feed it takes to put on a pound of weight gain, and that can range from about three pounds of feed to 45 pounds of feed when we're talking about a creep feeder, on average, I'll figure about 12 to 15 pounds of creep feed per pound of feed. In most situations where we're looking at 12 to 15 pounds of feed for a pound of weight gain, it's costing us more than what that pound of weight gain is worth. Um, so creep feeding is not something that always adds money. In fact, a lot of times it costs us more money than we get back in that situation. So if you're going to do that, you need to make sure you really look closely at the economics of creep feeding. Other ways we can uh, increase the value of those calves and income is maybe we're selling into some type of a branded program. Um, there's a lot of different ones out there. Um, and sometimes we're selling into some without even realizing it just because those cattle may qualify for that branded program later. So an example of that would be something like Certified Angus Beef or CAB. Another example of a branded program is Laura's Lean or um, there, there are several other ones out there. One you may be seeing if you watch uh, video auction sales like Superior's, you'll see the term NHTC, which stands for non-hormone treated cattle, meaning those calves have never received a growth promoting implant. And so they're eligible for export to certain countries. At one point in time, there was a decent premium for that. At this point in time, there's so many cattle that are being marketed that way. Typically, there's, there's very little to no premium. And so by not implanting those calves, we may be uh, giving up some profit potential there. Uh, but that's what the NHTC is. Uh, GAP is another kind of certification that you follow certain additional practices uh, that may help uh, market those calves later on. To really take advantage of NHTC and GAP and some of those things, you've got to be selling in truckload lots of cattle. So some other things to increase income, a big one is when we're marketing calves is make sure we reduce shrink. And what we mean by shrink is if we took a set of scales out to the pasture and weighed that calf, and then we haul that calf to town and he stands at the auction market for several hours and then they run him through the ring and sell him, what's the difference in the weight there? So that would be the shrink we're talking about. That can be very significant when we talk about Unweaned calves, it's not uncommon for those calves to shrink 8 to 12%, depending on time of year. 
So to keep the mass simple, if we just say a 500 pounds steer that shrunk 10%, that's 50 pounds less we have when it comes time to sell those calves. So anything we can do to help manage that shrink is going to be beneficial for us. So the way we handle those cattle, if we can handle those cattle calmly and quietly without them getting excited, that's going to help us. If those calves are getting excited and so they start to urinate and defecate more or they're not eating quite as much, that's going to reduce the shrink. And so that's weight that we don't get paid for, uh, that we're losing in that situation. Uh, a weaned calf will shrink less than an unweaned calf. Uh, also to help reduce shrink is minimize the amount of time between when that calf leaves your place and when he goes across the scale at that auction market. And so if you can haul those calves in the morning of the sale versus the night before, that's going to be advantageous from a shrink standpoint. For those of you who may be participating in a preconditioned calf sale, you may actually consider taking those calves in two to three days early and have them feed the calves hay and water uh, and let them fill back up. And so we we don't lose that shrink there. Now those unweaned calves, they won't fill back up real well, but the weaned calves, uh, if we get them in there early enough, they can. So that's something we definitely want to think about and be aware of. Just going to mention value of gain here real quickly. And so a lot of people want to kind of, when they wean calves, feed them more to try to put weight gain on them. We have to look at what is that weight gain worth versus what it cost us. So if we think about selling a 500 pound steer at $1.60 versus a 560 pound steer at $1.51. So the Heavier steer brings 845.60. The lighter steer brings 800. So that's a difference of $45.60. We added 60 pounds of weight gain. So 45.60 divided by 60 pounds of weight gain tells us each additional pound of weight gain we put on there was worth 76 cents. All right. So if we're spending more than that, then we're losing money. Unfortunately, a lot of people think, well, Every additional pound I put is going to be worth a buck 51 or whatever that 560 pound steers weighing and bringing. And that's just not the case. So we just got to make sure we calculate that value of gain. I mentioned implant earlier. Uh, if we implant those nursing calves, uh, and we would want to do that roughly about 90 days, 90 to 120 days before weaning or before we sell those calves we can get an extra 15 to 25 pounds of weight gain there. That implant's typically going to cost us a dollar to maybe $2. Uh, Value-added marketing requires we wean those calves. So if we're selling in a preconditioned calf we sell, we have to wean them. We also have to castrate them. I mentioned those premiums can go anywhere from 5 to 8 or $10 per hundred weight on average. Uh, sometimes you may see them a little bit more than that. When we think about preconditioned calves, we really got to think about what it costs us versus what that additional value is. And if we do it right, we can capture some additional value. If we do it wrong, it may cost us. So we got to think about the cost of the vaccines. That's not a big deal. Cost of feed is the big one. To really make preconditioned calves work, we're not trying to put a ton of weight on them. We want those calves gaining half a pound to maybe a pound and a quarter a day. The key is we want to do it on grass with as little supplement as possible. Uh, the other advantage of preconditioning, especially if we think about in the fall, by preconditioning calves, we may shift them out of that low market to that market that's increasing just a little bit. So that's something to think about. Just mention weaning real quick. The goals of a weaning program for those preconditioned calf sales is to reduce health problems and increase performance of those calves later on in the production phase. And so that's going to increase value of those calves when we sell them. And then it can significantly reduce shrink as well. And so that's an additional value as well. To do that, we need to wean those calves for at least 45 days. A lot of the preconditioned calf sales here in the last two years have increased that to a 60-day um, preconditioned period. 
And then whether they're preconditioned or not, we just want to always make sure we're reducing stress when we're gathering and handling those cattle as much as possible. And so that's kind of what I wanted to cover from the marketing standpoint. Any questions you have, feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat box or go ahead and unmute and ask those questions. Any questions for Dr. Banta? Well, if not, uh, we want to thank you, uh, Dr. Banta, for spending time with us, uh, uh, sharing about marketing. Thank y'all for having me. Yes, sir. And again, we'd like to uh, thank Dr. Ashley James as well uh, for uh, this going on our third year of the Beef and Lunch and Learn series. Uh, anything you want to add, Ms. Savannah? Um, if y'all could just fill out the poll. And then again, thank you, Dr. Banta, for joining us. Um, again, he is um, the Extension Beef Cattle Specialist in Overton, Texas. So, and his information is right there if y'all need it. And if you have a, another question that's not related to marketing, feel free to go ahead and ask that. I'd be happy to answer those. So we do have a question that come, came in. Does band castration, is it frowned upon or preferred? Um, so it depends on who you ask. Uh, if you talk to buyers of calves, they're typically going to want those calves to be knife castrated and not banned. And if we look at some of the preconditioned calf cells, they will require you to knife castrate those calves rather than banding them. The reason for that is, is unfortunately, when bands are used, sometimes they get applied incorrectly. And so we don't remove any testicles. Or what happens a lot of times is we remove one testicle and the other testicle gets left in the body. And that's a bigger challenge than not having a calf castrated. Um, so if you are going to band, make sure that's acceptable by the marketing program you're going to go through and make sure you have two testicles below that band. Also, I would encourage you to probably go ahead and purchase new bands each year and then make sure you don't put those bands on the dash of the pickup in the sun because that will really deteriorate them. And the other challenge we see with banding is sometimes you put the band on you have both testicles below the band, but before the band does its job, it breaks in that situation. Um, the big thing is the sooner we can castrate those calves, the easier it will be. Um, and if we knife castrate those calves at a young age, uh, very, very low risk and very little bleeding on that. So hopefully that answered your question. If not, go ahead and chat back in and, and we can visit some more. Okay, good deal. Any other questions before we adjourn? Okay. I guess everybody did the polls. Okay, I appreciate it, uh, Dr. Ben, once again, for joining us. And I think that will be it. <laughs>